Hey guys, Ega here. My new T1 build, featuring the RTX 5090 Founders Edition, is ready, and in today's video I'm going to tell you all about it. With the right tweaks and the right setup, performance and cooling in this tiny case is very impressive, and surprisingly it's not far off from my open air setup. What I'm showing you today is in my humble opinion the best air-cooled setup you can build in the T1 today. We've got an official travel kit to look at, a brand new PCIe Gen 5 riser, and of course some tweaks and mods to squeeze every last drop of cooling performance from the T1. Let's go over the setup and how it performs, and then later on I'll go into specific details for those of you who will want to use this video as a reference for your own builds. Just like in my previous air-cooled build with the 4090 Founders Edition, I have the case set up in the 3-slot mode. Yes, the 5090 FE is only a 2-slot card, but I'm running it here with a 1-slot gap in between the GPU and motherboard to facilitate airflow from the new double flow-through design. The new travel kit is designed with this in mind, and it comes with everything you need in order to customize the amount of offset added to the GPU. It also comes with a new GPU anti-sag bracket and the new riser lock bar. On the other side of the case, we have the Thermalrite AXP90 X47 full copper cooler sitting on top of a Ryzen 7 9800X3D CPU. But instead of the included 90mm fan, I'm using a Silverstone Air Slimmer 120mm fan mounted to a 3D printed bracket for added airflow. To squeeze as much performance as possible out of this tiny cooler, I'm also using these new offset brackets from Dinky Designs, which shift the cooler downwards so that the center of the cold plate sits directly on top of the hottest part of the CPU. Power supply is handled by the Corsair SF1000, which has more than enough power headroom and it's practically completely silent. For case fans, I'm using two 30mm thick Corsair RS120 Max fans mounted to the updated version of my custom exhaust shroud. The exhaust shroud has four angled scoops that help direct airflow, and it also makes fan mounting a bit more convenient as the fans can now be secured in place with M3 screws. So let's take a look at how the completed build performs. I ran a 20 minute Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty soak test on the T1 build, as well as on an open air setup with the Noctua NHT15 cooler to serve as a baseline for CPU performance, as that's the only place where I foresee any issues with the build. Both test scenarios were sound normalized to 37 decibels, measured at a distance of 50 centimeters, which is what I used for all my testing today. On the T1, it sounds like this. So, looking at the results, we see that the 5090 Founders Edition is running only 3 degrees hotter on average inside the T1 compared to the open air setup, which is seriously impressive. Do keep in mind, however, that all testing done was with the GPU running my daily undervolt profile. I put out a video on undervolting the 5090 Founders Edition a while back, and in my opinion, it's practically mandatory. You get better temperatures and reduced power consumption, with the same or even better performance relative to stock. CPU temperatures are also very impressive. The 9800X2D handles gaming loads with ease, and here the tiny XP90 X47 full copper cooler is delivering excellent performance with a maximum temperature only 5 degrees higher than the one achieved on my open air setup with the Noctua D15. If we take a look at the log for the entire run, we see that CPU wattage mostly hovered around 62 watts, which explains why this tiny cooler managed to perform so well. And the same is true for pretty much all other gaming workloads. In a 30 minute session of intense demon slaying in Doom the Dark Ages, the build barely broke a sweat with a max of only 65 degrees on the 5090 and 75 degrees on the 9800X3D. In Star Wars Outlaws, with every setting maxed out, running DLSS performance and multi-frame generation, we get a maximum GPU temperature of 72.5 degrees and only 68 degrees on the CPU. I tested Baldur's Gate 3 next, and this is a title that can be particularly taxing, especially when running it without the frame cap. Here we reach a maximum of 80.5 degrees on the CPU, with an average temperature of 77 degrees. The maximum boost clock is maintained, as we're still well below the 95 degree thermal limit of the 9800X3D. We get great results in God of War Ragnarok as well. For this test, I ran the game at 4K medium settings with DLSS performance, which corresponds to an input resolution of 1080p. With the test sequence running at nearly 300 frames per second, we get a maximum of 75 degrees on the CPU and 63 degrees on the GPU. So far, all these tests show us that for gaming loads, air cooling the 9800X3D in the Form T1 gets us impressive results. But there are situations where the thermal ride cooler gets easily overwhelmed. One such situation is the shader compilation step that some games do on their initial installation or after a driver update. 
This usually takes a couple of minutes, but it's one of the most intensive loads I've seen outside of synthetic benchmarks. If we take a look at this log recorded during shader compilation, we see that the CPU very quickly reaches its thermal limit and starts struggling with holding maximum boost. Comparing it to the same test but on my OpenBench setup, we get a completely different story. The CPU easily maintains its maximum boost clock and temperatures top out at only 81 degrees. So what can we do here to improve CPU thermals inside the T1? My 9800X3D is already tuned with a negative offset of 20 via AMD's Curve Shaper feature. Sadly, that's as much as my sample can handle. It's a bit of a lemon, but that is just luck of the draw when it comes to CPUs. If we take a look at the power drawn throughout the test, we see that the ceiling for what my setup here can handle, outside of short duration spikes, is about 120 watts. So we have two options here, either we let the CPU bounce off the 95 degree thermal limit, which AMD claims is completely safe and is working as intended, or we could limit the maximum power the CPU is allowed to draw. I added a 100 watt power limit in BIOS and reran the initial shader compilation in God of War Ragnarok. Looking at the new log, we see that power draw is now a completely flat line at exactly 100 watts, just as we wanted. The maximum boost clock still struggles, as now we're power limited, but we still get a respectable clock speed average of 5 GHz and a maximum temperature of 86 degrees, 10 degrees lower than before. For peace of mind, I think it's a worthwhile compromise to make, especially if you're a bit skittish about running the CPU at high temperatures. Still, what this shows us is that all core CPU intensive tasks are not an ideal match for this build. As I'm not a big fan of synthetic benchmarks, what I decided to do in order to test the productivity limits of this particular setup was a full Chromium source code compile, an extremely intensive workload that can take hours to complete on 8 core CPUs. I tested the OpenAir setup first to serve as a reference, and no surprises there. The 9800X3D held its maximum boost clock throughout the duration of the test, and the average CPU temperature was only 70 degrees, with a single spike up to a maximum of 92 degrees. Inside the T1 build, however, the CPU goes right up to its thermal limit and the boost clock starts struggling almost immediately, just like it did with the shader compilation in God of War Ragnarok. So I re-added the 100 watt power limit in BIOS and re-ran the compiled test. The boost clock was again lower, as expected, but temperatures were a lot saner as a result, settling at around 85 degrees with a spike up to a maximum of 90 degrees. Personally, I'm a lot more comfortable letting the system run for hours like this, even if it's mostly a psychological thing. But what about lost performance? The OpenAir setup completed the Chromium test in 156 minutes and 48 seconds, while the T1 build with the 100W limit in place took about 10 minutes longer, which is an increase in compile time of about 5%. Now, to be fair, users running these sorts of workloads are likely to use a different CPU altogether and a more appropriately sized cooling solution. But I think it's important to make it clear that in specific cases this setup may not be the right one to go for. In my case, almost every software I use in my day-to-day -day activities supports GPU hardware acceleration, like DaVinci Resolve Studio for example, which is what I use to edit my YouTube videos. So for me, all core CPU workloads simply aren't a priority. As a sanity check, I wanted to verify if the 100W power limit affects gaming performance in any way. I benchmarked God of War Ragnarok again and averaged the results over 3 runs, and I would say that the performance difference is within margin of error. Before we continue on with the video, I'd like to make an announcement. I decided I'll be focusing full time on my YouTube channel, which will mean more frequent builds and videos from yours truly. If you enjoy the content and would like to support me, then using the affiliate links in the description would go a long way. Or you could consider joining my newly launched Patreon, where you'll be able to find behind the scenes updates as well as things like fan control configs, RTSS overlay files and more. Your support there will be highly appreciated and will directly help fund future builds and interesting videos. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I saved the actual build process for last as there's quite a few things I want to touch on. Let's start with prepping the motherboard. For this build, I decided to remove the stock M5 CPU retention bracket and use Thermal Grizzly's M5 contact frame instead, as well as Thermal Grizzly's M4 threaded AM5 backplate. The contact frame is totally optional, its only real use is to make it easier to clean thermal paste, especially when doing a lot of cooler installations. The thinking with the backplate, however, is to make installation of the Thermalrite exp 90 x 47 a bit easier. The stock AM5 backplate uses UNC threads, while the Thermalrite cooler uses M3 threads on its mounting screws. These need to go through the backplate in order to be secured with M3 nuts from the other side. With the stock backplate, it's doable, but somewhat difficult. With the M4 threaded holes on the Thermal Grizzly backplate, the mounting screws can more easily pass through, but there's actually a better solution here which I'll mention in just a minute. 
also be using these new offset brackets from Dinky Designs for mounting the cooler. These shift the cooler slightly so that the cold plate is centered on the CPU's hottest area, which on Ryzen chips is slightly offset from the center of the IHS. For the offset brackets, you can use either the short or the long mounting screws included with the thermal ride cooler. Since we'll have quite a big gap between the motherboard and the 5090FE, we don't have to worry about anything protruding on the other side. I'm using Thermal Grizzly's new Duronaut paste here, which they were kind enough to provide for this video. This thermal paste is designed for long-term stability and minimizing pump out, but with the same excellent thermal conductivity that Thermal Grizzly is known for. I first tried spreading it with the included plastic tools, but quickly gave up on that and just went with an X pattern instead. Much simpler and quicker, if you ask me. With the cooler now added, I started threading in the nuts with the included thumb screw tool. The offset brackets feature a leaf spring design, and the idea with this is to avoid over tightening the cooler by visually inspecting the deflection of the leaf spring. This is easier said than done, as it doesn't take much to start seeing a bend, and it's quite difficult to get a good look at the leaf spring from all angles. In the end, I added just a bit of bend and tried to keep both sides equal as much as possible. But I mentioned earlier there's actually a better way to go about it. Dinky also sell a special M5 backplate that has even bigger pass-through holes, and with it you can skip the stock mounting screws altogether. Instead, you would use these included shoulder bolts and thread them in from the backplate. These have hard stops built into them, so no more guesswork figuring out the right mounting pressure. As mentioned earlier in the video, instead of the stock 90mm fan, I'm using this 3D printed bracket designed by Bagoon over on printables, which allows mounting a 120mm fan on top of the AXP90X47 full copper. For the fan, I'm using the Silverstone Air Slimmer 120. The printed bracket uses threaded heatset inserts, so in order to secure the fan, I used 8mm long M3 socket head screws. And with that, we're done with getting everything ready on the motherboard, and I have to say, I really like the way it all looks together. It's super compact, and the total height of the cooler plus the fan is low enough that we won't be getting any fan turbulence noise in the 3-slot configuration of the T1. Next, let's take a look at the new travel kit. Included, we have the replacement IO bracket that replaces the stock one on the 5090 Founders Edition. Next, we have the new anti-sag bracket, and I have to say, I really like that it now features the T1 barcode logo. It's nice attention to detail, and I'm all for that. We also get additional standoffs to use in combination with the ones already included with the T1. And finally, there's a new riser lock bar, which helps keep the riser securely slotted into the motherboard. Next, I'll be prepping the riser bar, starting with the 40mm standoff needed for the 3 slot configuration of the case. After that, I add two 10mm standoffs on each of the two riser mounting holes of the riser bar, totaling up to a 20mm offset or one GPU slot. Once that's done, the riser should look like this. For the riser itself, I'm using the upcoming official PCIe Gen 5 riser. I really like the way it looks, and I'm happy to report that throughout my testing, I had absolutely no issues with black screens or having to force the riser into Gen 4 mode. In addition to the riser offset, I'm also using two 5mm standoffs on the PSU bracket that connects to the top strut. In total, this will add up to a 25mm gap between the 5090 and the backside of the PSU. Right, so let's prep the 5090, starting with the IO bracket included in the travel kit. As you probably noticed already, I like replacing all the stock Phillips head screws with hex head screws instead, as I think they just look better and they don't strip quite as easily. The GPU IO bracket attaches to the rear shift bracket of the T1 with a couple of M3 screws, and then the assembly gets inserted into the rear panel of the T1 and secured with two more screws. The configuration here depends on how you have the case set up and how much offset you're adding to the GPU. But if you're going for my one slot offset configuration, then your rear panel should look like this. So then, off to the 5090 itself. Two things we need to take care of here. First, we remove the stock rear IO plate. Fortunately, it's even easier than before as there's only 4 screws here of the Torx T8 variety. We don't have to get inside the car this time around, maybe Nvidia knows all about the travel kits, who knows. Secondly, we need to add the anti-sag GPU mounts onto the 5090. There's no magnetic cover to remove like on the 4090, just two tiny Torx T5 screws that reveal the anti-sag mounting holes. The new mount even has two dedicated holes for these tiny screws so that they don't get misplaced. Instead, we used two 8mm long M3 screws to secure the mount onto the 5090. The entire rear panel then gets attached onto the 5090 with the four original Torx T8 screws. The result is perhaps the largest I.O. bracket in the history of GPU I.O. brackets. Lastly, we add the anti-sag bracket and attach it to the GPU mount with two more screws. After all this prep work, we can finally start assembling the case, starting with the two side struts connecting them to the front panel. 
It's best to leave these a bit loose for now as it makes it easier to attach the whole thing to the rear panel, or should I say, to the GPU. You can now tighten everything, including the anti-sag bracket and the four screws securing the side struts. We finally get something that resembles a case now. It's a bit weird building the case around the GPU like this, but to me it makes things easier and less prone to accident. If you have a front USB Type-C cable, then you should add it before you secure the front panel assembly, as otherwise access to it will be blocked by the GPU. Next up we add the riser bar. I find it best to first slot it into the GPU and afterwards secure it with the two required screws, one for the rear panel and one for the side strut. The T1 already looks pretty awesome with just the 5090FE and it's amazingly solid. There's zero flex and absolutely no GPU sag. If you ever end up building one of these, you'll never get old of how solid it all feels. I'm giving the riser cable a bit of a bend along its midpoint here, which will make it sit away from the GPU, essentially giving as much breathing room to the GPU as possible. When adding the motherboard, you may find it easier to remove the side strut directly above it, as it also helps with tightening the motherboard screws. With the motherboard secured and the riser slotted in, I wanted to also add the new riser lock bar, but I just could not get it to slide over the new Gen 5 riser. I think the riser bar was designed with the old riser in mind, so I had to give up on it. I didn't have any issues with the riser popping out of the motherboard PCIe slot, but the riser lock bar would indeed be a nice to have. I'm sure it will get updated once the new riser goes up on the store. Next it's time to add the power supply, but before that make sure you also add the power button to the front panel. It's especially important to make sure that the PSU sits as straight as possible, relative to the edge of the front panel, especially if you're using the 5mm offset, otherwise you may end up in situations where the side panel will bulge slightly. You can tweak the alignment of the PSU when tightening the side screw that secures it to the front panel. Now is also the time to add the power cord extension. You can cable manage it in a number of ways, but here I just ran it over the top edge of the motherboard and up the side of the PSU. The famous NVIDIA 12V 2x6 cable is next. At least the new angled connector on the 50 series Founders Edition makes it a lot easier to cable manage in the T1. I'm using a custom set of cables here made by Cablester, which have per wire lengths customized specifically for the T1. I used the exact same set in my liquid cooled setup in the Nanoc R with the 4090 and had absolutely no issues. They are not 100% mandatory, but they are orders of magnitude easier to work with than the stock Corsair ones. So with everything connected, the build is almost done. Again, I'm impressed with how solid everything fits and how tightly everything is packed. That's why I love coming back to the T1 every time. Just imagine if the T1 had the exact same finish and color as the 50 series Founders Edition cards. It's probably the only thing I have on my wishlist at this point for the T1. The last piece of the puzzle is adding in my 3D printed exhaust shroud. The updated version comes in two parts, to make it easier to print on printers with smaller bed sizes. For this particular setup, using offset brackets and the larger 120mm fan, there's a special version with a slightly shorter scoop on the CPU side. I'm using Corsair RS120 Max fans this time around instead of the Fantex T30s I used before. I prefer the all black look of the Corsair fans, but you can get whichever you find available as they perform about the same. The cables on these fans are a bit long and you can't daisy chain them like you can with the T30s, but you can use the zip tie holes on the exhaust shroud to cable manage these neatly out of the way. And with that, the build is finally done. All that's left is to add the two side panels and the top panel. So this video was a bit long, but I hope you guys found all the information useful. I tried to preemptively cover a lot of the questions I've seen asked here on YouTube, as well as on the SFF Hub Discord server. I'll have every part used in this build linked in the video description, together with links to the 3D printed mods and anything else that's relevant. If there's something I missed, or if you guys have any questions for me, I'm looking forward to answering them in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed the video, thank you for sticking around until the end, I'll see you guys in the next one real soon. Bye for now.